Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. A few weeks ago I discussed the Saha equation and why it cannot be used to determine the pressure at the level of the chromosphere. In that video I quoted Professor Zirin who emphasized in his famous 1966 text on the solar atmosphere that the Saha equation can result in error in the ranges of millions to trillion fold. Zirin never changed his mind on the subject in his last major text, Astrophysics of the Sun, published in 1988, Zirin affirmed his conviction that the Saha equation had no place in treating the atmosphere of the Sun. Here is what he wrote. So the Saha and Boltzmann laws are directly applicable only to the unseen gases below the surface of the Sun. In short, in Zirin's opinion, the Saha equation and the Boltzmann equation cannot be used to examine the Sun at all because we cannot even see spectroscopic lines below the solar surface. The solar atmosphere is not in thermal equilibrium and that is why we cannot use the Saha equation to analyze it. Now if you read the solar physics literature, you will come to recognize that the atmosphere of the Sun is treated today with complex models. It is not just a matter of utilizing the Saha equation. Solar physicists are examining the spectroscopic lines and fitting them to models involving temperature, pressure, and optical depth. The models have become increasingly complex as reflected here, but even an old one-dimensional model such as this famous one is still in use. In the laboratory, spectroscopic lines can be sensitive to temperature, pressure, electric, and magnetic fields. Solar physicists make use of these characteristics. The question is, have they properly addressed the problem of the solar atmosphere with these methods? In this video, I wish to take a moment to explore the behavior of spectroscopic lines in the laboratory, such that everyone can come to have some knowledge of what is being examined in solar physics. If this is your first exposure to electronic spectra, take heart. This is a complex field and increased knowledge will take place with time and study. In the next video, I will explain why things are much more complex than currently recognized in the solar atmosphere. So hang in there. Chromospheric spectroscopic lines cannot be analyzed in the same manner as we treat gases in the laboratory. Now let's begin to learn something about spectroscopy. I have spent much of my life in this area of science and that is also the key to understanding astronomy. To begin, here is a sketch of a spectroscopic line. There is a great deal of information contained in such lines. First there is the position of the central wavelength of the line. This can be used to ascertain the type of atom which is either absorbing as in the Fraunhofer spectrum or emitting as in the chromospheric spectrum. Electronic spectroscopic lines are produced when electrons undergo transitions between electronic energy levels within the atom. I have briefly gone through this in this video. The National Institutes of Standards and Technology keeps an extensive record of spectroscopic lines for each atom and for many of the ions associated with those atoms. Let's go through a few screenshots from their web page which is linked below. Here's what the top of the page looks like for iron 2. That is an iron atom which has lost a single electron. One can see that nearly 14,000 spectroscopic lines have been identified for this ion. We also see that the lines are being measured either in vacuum or in air. Next, we see the value of the maximum relative intensity for the most powerful line, in this case 1,800,000. If we move to the top of the table, we see that the data is organized in several columns. The first describes the wavelength where the line is observed. The Ritz wavelength is the position where it should appear theoretically based on the two energy levels involved in the transition. Next comes the relative intensity of the line. AKI is the Einstein coefficient. It gives the probability per unit time that an electron will spontaneously decay from the upper energy state to the lower energy state. E sub i is the energy of the lower level and E sub k is the energy of the upper level. Next we find two extremely important columns. They describe the electronic energy levels involved in the transition. So the first line of iron 2 in this registry emits at a wavelength of 89.9916 nanometers. 
When it does so, the ion is undergoing a transition from the 3d6 5f1 state to the 3d7 state. The electron moved from an f orbital into a d orbital. Now the nature of these electronic transitions is extremely important as I demonstrated in these videos. When we consider spectroscopic lines in the atmosphere of the Sun, we have to examine the ensemble of electronic transitions which are taking place because that can tell us something about the processes in this region of the Sun and whether they are random or not. The position of the line tells us a great deal about the atom undergoing the transition, but the position can also tell us a bit more. If the object producing the line is moving towards the observer, the line will be shifted to lower wavelengths, which corresponds to higher frequency. We say that the line is blue shifted. If the object is moving away from the observer, it will be shifted to the red and the wavelength will increase. These are simple Doppler effects, just like Doppler effects we observe when we listen to a train whistle as it passes by. If the central peak is displaced relative to where it is expected, the position of the line tells us something about the motion of the source. That is how the idea of redshifts for galaxies work. In addition, Einstein tells us that the position of the line can also give us some information about gravity. According to him, some lines experience gravitational redshifts. For example, this is seen in the redshift of the hydrogen alpha line in White Dwarfs. We will return to that topic in a future video. Next, after considering the frequency of a line, we have to look at its width. Every spectroscopic line has something called natural line width. A spectroscopic line is not a delta function which is extremely sharp and located at a single frequency. The line actually has some broadening associated with it, namely its width. Natural line broadening is related to the lifetime that atoms spend in the excited state and the uncertainty of the energy value in these states. Such broadening gives a Lorentzian shape. The lower energy level of the atom does not contribute to the natural spectral width because an electron can stay in the lowest energy level for an indefinite period. Conversely, all excited states have widths because the amount of time the electron will spend in that state before moving to a lower energy state is not infinite. The natural width of a line for any given transition is given by this equation where FWHM stands for the full width at half maximum of the line. That is this distance on the line. Gamma i and gamma k refer to the widths of each state involved in the transition. Natural line broadening is not generally critical relative to understanding the Sun because most solar lines have line widths which are much larger than would be expected from natural broadening. Beyond the natural line width, it is known that temperature can broaden a line. This is also known as Doppler line broadening and gives a Gaussian line shape. Note that now we are talking about the broadening of the spectral line, not its shift. Doppler line broadening is caused by random thermal motions of atoms in the source of the radiation. Locally, atoms are moving either towards or away from the detector, so now we get Doppler shifts. But this time, because there's motion in both directions, this motion broadens the line symmetrically about the central position. There is a distribution of speeds at which atoms are moving in the sample and so we get a distribution of frequencies and this acts to broaden the line. It is directly related to temperature and that is how the astronomers believe that they can measure the temperature of the solar atmosphere. They can examine the line widths of certain lines which they believe are not broadened by other effects. Here is the equation for first order Doppler line broadening. One can see that the amount of broadening depends on the frequency of the line and the square root of the temperature. It is also related to the inverse square root of the mass. Next, a line can also be broadened by pressure or collisional effects. This produces a Lorentzian line shape, at least at lower pressures. Pressure effects depend on the nature of the atoms, the density of the gas, and the period of collision. Here is the equation for pressure line broadening at relatively low densities when the time of interaction between the two atoms is so short that it could be neglected. The full width at half maximum is now governed by four parameters. First, of course, it is governed by the pressure, P, which is the variable we aim to determine with this equation. In addition, it is governed by the square root of the temperature, T, and the mass of the atom in question, M. However, another factor, D, comes into play. Little d corresponds to the collision diameter, which is the effective separation between the centers of the atoms when they collide. Now, in this equation, d is actually the biggest unknown. That is because it depends on atomic dimensions in the excited state when the electrons are in higher orbits than they would be in the ground state. In any event, under normal atmospheric pressures, 
The effect of pressure broadening is on the order of the temperature broadening, as we reviewed above. Now, if the pressure gets very high, one can observe very large and asymmetric line broadening because now the time of interaction between atoms cannot be neglected. That discussion, however, is beyond the scope of this video. The next important consideration for line formation in spectroscopy is called the Stark effect. It can alter both the width and the shift of a spectroscopic line. Stark effects are the result of electric fields around the emitting atom. In the plasma, this electric field can be produced by three separate types of effects. The first is due to the average field due to the ion itself. The second is by a field due to the proximal dipole moments. And the third by a field due to quadrupole moments. The quantum mechanical effects associated with Stark line broadening and shifts are complex, but we can make progress by noting just a few things of importance to astrophysics. First, it is well known that the hydrogen bomber lines can experience profound linear Stark effects in the laboratory. For instance, at the beginning of the last century, it was reported that when hydrogen at a pressure of about two atmospheres was subjected to a high voltage arc discharge, the bomber lines experienced profound asymmetric line broadening. The widths of the hydrogen alpha, beta, and gamma lines increased by 25, 100, and 200 angstroms. That was a linear effect. And so hydrogen bomber lines have long been known to experience profound linear Stark broadening. The same is true for hydrogen-like ions. This broadening scales with the square of the principal quantum number n, so the lines get broader and broader as n increases. The increased broadening with increased principal quantum number results in the merging of the Balmer lines at high end values. This has been used by the astronomers to measure the electron density of flares, for instance, using the Inglis-Teller formula, where n sub s is the principal quantum number where the merger of the line occurs, z is the charge of the ion, a naught is the Bohr radius, and n sub e is the electron density. The expression is sometimes seen in simplified form as follows and sometimes with a correction factor for spectral quality, but all provide essentially the same result. It is also known that non-hydrogenic lines, such as neutral magnesium, are usually only sensitive to quadratic Stark effects, which are much smaller in magnitude. Theoretically, if the external field is strong enough, a linear effect can become important, even for these atoms, but the presence of such strong electric fields in the solar atmosphere is unlikely. Similarly, quadrupolar effects can become important for hydrogen in the presence of very strong electric fields. It should also be noted that in the presence of strong electric fields, electronic transitions, which are normally forbidden, such as 2s to 1s transitions, can take place. More details can be found in these texts. I have covered electronic transitions and selection rules already in this video, and I give an example of a forbidden transition in this video. Many believe that Stark line broadening provides a direct measure of the free electron density in the atmosphere of the Sun. In fact, in the laboratory, this is clearly the case, as one can learn in this paper, where the electron density in a plasma was determined from the shift of the hydrogen alpha line. From the width and shift of the hydrogen alpha line, it is easy to compute the electron density. In standard Stark theory, the width of the hydrogen alpha spectral line increases as the number of electrons to the two-thirds power, while the shift increases towards the red as a linear function of the number of electrons. Of course, in this case, the electric field in the laboratory plasma is being governed entirely by the free electron density. That is not the case for the chromospheric lines, as we will explore in the next video. There is one other means of increasing the line width of a spectroscopic line. This is referred to as resonance broadening. It occurs when an atom in the excited state transfers its energy to another proximal atom, either through a photon which is absorbed or directly through interatomic collisions. In the first instance, the energy is transferred to a ground state atom and we end up with a resonance with a broadened top. In the second case, we get resonance broadening of the spectral line without distortion. Now we have covered line shifts and line broadening. Of course, in the Sun there can be other effects. One of these includes the splitting of a spectral line due to magnetic fields, as evidenced by the Zeeman effect. This effect was first observed by George Ellery Hale in sunspots at the turn of the last century. Hale was prompted to search for the presence of magnetic fields in sunspots by his belief that the flocculi he saw around sunspots obtained in hydrogen alpha revealed that the magnetic fields existed in the spot, as one can learn in this classic paper. However, the line splitting which he observed was not in hydrogen alpha, but principally in iron lines. Here is an illustration of what he obtained. One sees the iron line splitting as a result of magnetic fields in the sunspot. 
This was certainly one of the greatest discoveries in the history of astrophysics. The Zeeman effect had been seen on the Sun. For today, I mention it for historical reasons. The lines which concern us in the chromosphere and just above the photosphere are not split by the Zeeman effect. Still, the Zeeman effect has been seen in the upper solar atmosphere as one can learn in this paper. We know the Zeeman effect primarily because it was discovered using spectroscopic lines, just not those lines from hydrogen. In the end, recent literature suggests that the fibrils which had prompted Hale's observation of sunspots do not appear to be associated with magnetic fields as one can learn in this paper. Finally, in addition to all these effects, spectral lines can also exhibit polarization as a result of Hanley effects. This is a means of sampling weak magnetic fields which might be present in the chromosphere and corona as one can learn in these papers. In the end, there are many physical and chemical processes which can be sampled with spectroscopic lines. This includes the nature of the emitting atom or ion, the electronic transitions involved, and the motion of the source. In addition, spectral lines can provide information relative to temperature, pressure, electric fields, and magnetic fields at the source. There is such a wealth of information available, but the secret remains as to how this information is interpreted and whether the conclusions we derive are correct for the setting which we are sampling. The solar atmosphere clearly has some association with gaseous plasmas in the laboratory, but that is not the entire story. This can dramatically alter our conclusions, as one will come to learn in the next video. Well, that is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the video to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.